Hi, this is Bob Murphy, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. My name is Doug Stewart, and today we have a special episode for you to listen to. In July of 2017, Nick Gossing and I were able to visit the Young Americans for Liberty Convention in Washington, D.C. And I have to say, of the few conventions or conferences that I've attended, this one was one of my favorite because there were a lot of like-minded people, not only in in terms of affirming the message of liberty, but there were a lot of questions related to Christianity and libertarianism and the how those intersect. And those questions were born out of a sincere heart by just about everybody who came up and asked us a question. They weren't antagonistic. It was basically a meeting of minds who think, how do we reach other Christians with the message of liberty? Now, the conference, of course, wasn't about that. That was what our breakout session was, which is what we're going to share with you today. At the end of the breakout session, we actually had some question and answer time, which we'll include in this episode. And I have to say, all of you who attended our session, who asked us questions on and off the record, or I should say on and off mic, we were just very impressed with all of you who who met with us and discussed with us. So thank you for attending our session if you're listening out there, and thank you for being part of this episode if you asked one of the questions. And I'm going to leave you with the rest of the episode. Uh, my name is Doug Stewart. I'm on the board of directors for the Libertarian Christian Institute, and our breakout today is going to talk about how to reach Christians with the message Uh, of liberty. Um, The Libertarian Christian Institute, our goal is to bring the message of liberty to Christians to help them embrace libertarianism, uh, if not in name, in principles, and to allow them to understand that there is a huge compatibility and an inherent, you know, coupling between the philosophy of liberty and Christianity. So, you know, if you're here, you probably already have a sense of this matters, but I want to just kind of cover why we think it matters that uh, Christians know more about liberty and how it is compatible with their faith. So, one, it's a major demographic in the United States, and so it is. it would kind of go without saying that if you can influence 71% of people, or at least a large portion of them, that could go a long way in spreading the message of liberty altogether. Another one is... It is an engine for generating ideas. Christians tend to, whether you're a Christian here or if you're just here to kind of get us some information, you probably already know that Christians hold their beliefs very strongly. And it is all about, uh, it, for many people, holding a belief and being able to defend that belief. So if you can win a Christian, you're often winning somebody who is going to tell other people, whether it's just about their faith or if they happen to be a pastor or leader of an organization, uh, nonprofits and things like that. Uh, they, you'll be able to generate ideas from them. So there's this already, they, they're propagators of ideas. And Christians, from a theological perspective, aim to be long-term catalysts for social change. Whether you see Christians on the left wanting to do leftist-type things or Christians on the right wanting to you know, in, implement a little bit more social social morality from a legal level, it it goes without saying that you can notice that both of them think what they're doing as Christians should influence the world for for good. And so as libertarians, we think that that is definitely, uh, that's good, but we think that our message, the message of liberty, is the one that they should be, of course, propagating. So whether you're a Christian or uh, whether you don't identify as a Christian, it matters to be able to reach others that follow Jesus Christ to to the liberty message because it is important uh, for for these reasons. I'm going to just briefly talk about um, how to, just things to keep in mind, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to Nick, who's our executive director, to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, theology and a little bit of history for you. 
So the first thing I would just say, and this is probably an easy one, start off well. Don't try to make an argument with a Christian that doesn't work on anybody else. Don't start with hardcore anarchism. Um, you can, even if you, <laughs> it's probably not, not a good idea. Plant the seeds if you're an anarchist, uh, which I guess I would identify that way. Uh, if you're an anarchist, you can plant those seeds, but <laughs> don't, don't like try to sell all of that all in one because it's probably not going to work on anybody, and let alone a Christian. We're, Christians are normal people too. Um, appeal to their fidelity to scripture and tradition. Um, some Protestants don't care much about tradition. Many do. Uh, you'll find that many Catholics appeal more to tradition than other, than other uh, denominations or religious you know, flavors, of, or Christian, flavors of Christianity, if you will. Uh, Protestants, by and large, are very... They're, they go back to the Bible all the time. And so if you're already a Christian and you, you need to know your Bible to talk with them and to use it, and we're, Nick's going to go over a few really important aspects, but they're faithful to their religious documents. That's what Christians are. If you're not a Christian, or if you have no interest in becoming one, or you just, you're here to learn how to communicate with a Christian, it does help to know some of the basic things about how the Bible uh, is pro-liberty, if you will, and is against statism. And Nick is going to give you kind of an introductory, introductory uh, uh, 15 minutes on it or so. One thing that's also helpful, if, if you know more than one Christian, unless they come from, say, the same church, and, uh, or if you're a Christian that has many friends, that you all have different ideas. You're from different denominations. So just like, think libertarians. I mean, we had a debate over anarchism and minarchism. There's a wide diversity, it's a broad camp. It's really helpful to remind people, and this is probably a general principle, that as a Christian, you don't have to buy into the pro-choice argument. Most Christians are not gonna become pro-choice. And so there is a place for a pro-life libertarian. There is a place for open and closed border libertarian. And so if you're talking with a Christian, you don't have to convince them of your style of libertarianism or the kind of libertarianism that you think is the most consistent, but they can find a home in the libertarian world without having to abandon some of the beliefs that they, that they hold dear. So there's a broad camp, just like uh, there's a lot of Christian uh, variations within Christianity. Conversations can lead to conversions, and conversations are often greater than conversions. Very rarely will you convince somebody in one converse, conversation. So if you are friends with people who uh, follow Jesus, you're probably not going to just turn their mind around based on one conversation. They're probably going to maybe look back uh, you know, in the future, if they've been converted to some extent, uh, they're going to say, yeah, that was a really influential conversation that I had. But that's going to be dependent on the way that you talk to them, the way that you treat them, not trying to, you know, seal the deal in that conversation. And of course, that this kind of principle uh, does work on just about anybody because the conversation uh, just is always going and you can kind of show that uh, the consistency. So in terms of actual, how do you connect with Christians and speak to what does the Bible say about liberty? We're going to have Nick talk a little bit about, he's going to go over some Old Testament things and some early church stuff. And then I'm going to wrap it up after that. And we're going to do some Q&A. All right. So like Doug said, you know, if you're going to be engaging in this discussion with Christians, uh, you know, you will need to, to know a little bit of theology. I'm, I'm sure most everyone here in this room knows or has, has maybe personally experienced that, you know, the Bible can be twisted around to say anything anybody wants it to say if they are determined enough to uh, force an argument out of it. So really when we're looking at what is a biblical theology of the state and Christianity and the state, you kind of have to look at the entire Bible and look at the, the themes that are there from beginning to end. And I will submit to you and demonstrate uh, briefly here that the biblical narrative is overwhelmingly anti-empire and anti-statism. And the reason for that is because the narrative is that God is king. Only God is king, Christ is Lord, and therefore man, Caesar, the president, what have you, uh, is, is not those things. Yep. So going back to the very beginning, Genesis, the Garden of Eden, there is no government, there is no state. We have God in perfect communion with man. Sin enters into the world, and as a result of that, we start to see the origins of the state crop up. So Cain, uh, one of the children of, of Adam and Eve, murders his brother Abel, and then the text says that he goes and founds a city 
in his own image and likeness. So this is the first body politic, if you will, in uh, Old Testament theology, it was founded by Cain after he murdered Abel and was exiled from the communion of God. We then see this theme crop up again after the flood narrative and the Tower of Babel. So you have Nimrod, goes onto the plains of Shinar and founds what became Babylon. They build the Tower of Babel and it is seen as man congregating to rule himself apart from God, man ruling over man, uh, and basically saying we don't, you know, we don't need God as our, as our king. And it's, it's intended to be a negative in the text and, and judgment is brought down as a result of that. We fast forward uh, quite some time into Israel under Moses. Uh, the, in, in the time of Moses, there, there was no king in Israel. Old Testament Israel is ruled by uh, the priesthood, the prophets, and God is directly mediating through that, but there is no king. There is nothing that we would think of as a state in the modern sense. And so when people try to uh, equate any modern nation state, including the United States or the modern nation state of Israel to Old Testament Israel, that's a, a false jump because there is no, we don't have Moses and the prophets here, you know, mediating uh, a, a civic society like they did in, at that time. And then when we move into the prophets, the book of uh, 1 Samuel, we see a shift. So the people of Israel come to Samuel, who's, who's one of the prophets, one of the judges, and they say, give us a king so that we may be like all the other nations. So they were envious of the pagan nations around them who all had human kings. They wanted a, a king of their own. And when you read the text, it says that Samuel goes to God and he's grieved by the request. And God says to Samuel, the people have not rejected you, but they have rejected me in being king over them. Nevertheless, grant their request. So the idea here is that the desire to be ruled by uh, men, the desire to be ruled by a human king, is a rejection of the kingship of God. Yep. But then throughout the rest of the Old Testament, the prophetic vision that is put forward by, by the prophets is that God still is the true king, and he is coming to restore his, his rightful reign over the earth. As we move into the New Testament, there's these terms that are, are everywhere in the Gospels about Jesus being Savior and Lord. And you have to know a little bit about first century uh, Greco-Roman history to get the context here, but those terms were politically loaded terms that were typically applied to the Roman emperor. Caesar is savior, Caesar is Lord. And so when the early Christians come along and say there is another king, Jesus, Jesus is our savior, Jesus is Lord, that is a direct challenge to the legitimacy of the empire. And then in the temptation narratives of Christ early in his public ministry, there's parallel accounts in the gospels of Matthew and Luke, uh, one of the temptations brought by the devil is human political power. So the devil says to Jesus, I have reign over all the kingdoms of the earth. They've been given into my hand. I give them to whoever I will. I will hand them over to you if you will bow down and worship me. Christ resists that temptation. But the idea here is that the kingdoms of the world, the state essentially, are in the, the domain of the devil. It is contrary to the kingship of God. Oftentimes, uh, I mean, throughout Jesus' life, we see this in the Gospels, he repeatedly runs into conflicts with the civil authorities. Uh, one of the passages that's often brought up uh, in these discussions is in Matthew 22, the famous render unto Caesar passage. This is a grossly misinterpreted passage many times. People see it as basically saying, oh, Jesus is just saying the tax is good, pay the tax. But when you actually read it, what it says before this incident happened is they were devising a plan to entrap Jesus. Because what was going on is you had the Jews who were very bitter at being ruled by Rome. They've been under foreign rule for centuries, Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Romans. Uh, and they, they resented being ruled by Rome and they didn't like to pay the tax to Rome. And so Jesus is being baited into a corner here. So if he says, yeah, the tax is good, pay the tax, that's going to put off all the Jews who were listening to him because they'll think, oh, this guy's just siding with Rome. On the other hand, if he says, don't pay the tax, the tax is bad, then he would be immediately arrested by the Roman government as a subversive. So what he does is he throws a question back on the people using, uh, using his, his 
rhetorical skill to make them ask the question, well, what really is Caesar's? What really is God's? <coughs> then you read the conclusion of the passage and it says the people marveled at his answer. So to interpret that as you know, Jesus saying the tax is good, pay the tax, uh, is, is not even the, the point of the passage at all. When we get to Jesus on trial in front of Pontius Pilate, uh, Pilate confronts Jesus and says, you know, the, that there's this claim that you are a king. Are you, are you in fact a king? And he, he says, you say that I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. So he's drawing a sharp contrast between Jesus' and God's way of ruling versus man and the state's way of ruling. And then ultimately the, the resurrection is the vindication of God becoming king again over the earth. He is, he is vindicated in the resurrection. Uh, throughout the New Testament, we can see various th uh, themes on this in the, in the epistles. I'm just going to cover a few verses that are often brought up as kind of like trump cards. So the most common being Romans 13. People go, oh, Romans 13, it says just obey the government, government's good. Well, that's not what it says. Uh, one of the things you have to remember about the Bible is that the, the chapter verse divisions were not in the original text. Those are artificial, they were added in the Middle Ages. So Romans is a letter that is meant to be read as a, in a complete sitting. And so in order to get the context, you have to at least go back to Romans 12, and really you have to read the entire book. But in Romans 12, Paul is talking about things like uh, overcome evil with good. Don't avenge yourselves, but trust the wrath of God. You know. Uh, as, as far as possible, be at peace with all men. And then when he gets into chapter 13, people kind of interpret it as, oh, he must be totally starting a new subject, but that makes no contextual sense at all. So really what he's doing in chapter 13 is he's expanding on by describing what the state does in practice, often which is the very thing he just told all the Christians not to do. And so when he says, submit to the authority, the idea here is considering that the state is under the sovereignty of God, it's not operating outside the control or the plan of God, and so he's just saying don't feel like you have to go be a revolutionary in the sense that in the first century there was the Zealot Party, uh, these were Jews who were organizing to overthrow the Roman government militarily, and then in AD 70 when that movement really started to pick up steam, uh, the Roman army came in and destroyed, destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, and slaughtered many, many people. So Paul's overriding concern here is making sure that the Christians remember what their priorities are and not getting caught up in these direct political conflicts, to just know that God is in charge and to stay focused on their, their work and their mission. So to interpret that as saying uh, the state is good, just do whatever it says, is a complete misreading of the text. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 is kind of just a parallel passage to, to Romans 13. Uh, I would you know, make the same essential argument uh, as, as Romans 13 there. That is the point of the text. It's not saying it's good. It's not saying do whatever it says. It's just saying realize that it is established in the sense that God is sovereign over it and it is not outside of his control. 1 Timothy 2 is something that's often cited by a lot of uh, well-known preachers where they tell us, oh, well, the Bible says pray for good government, pray for good leaders, pray for these laws to pass. Uh, but when you actually read it, it doesn't say anything like that. What it says is pray for those who are in positions of authority so that we, the church, may live quiet and dignified and godly lives. So the idea is he's actually saying pray that the government will leave us alone. Uh, so, thank you. And then as we move on into Revelation, the, the last book in the New Testament canon, uh, the, the portrait is overwhelmingly of the, the final victory of God over all rival powers, rulers, and authorities, which includes the kings of the earth. And so I'm not going to get into whether you, know, you want to interpret Revelation literally or whether it's metaphorical. or I mean, there's a, that, that, that's a whole other thing. But the, the point is it's portraying that God is resuming his kingship over the earth and all the empires and the states of the earth have been put down and essentially subjected to the rightful reign of Jesus. Now, oftentimes, uh, throughout Christian history, this has not been the, the, the way it's been interpreted, but 
what I will suggest to you here and, and demonstrate is that if you go back to the earliest portions of Christian history, so the first three centuries or so, this was predominantly the way it was interpreted. So one of the big shifts in Christian history was when Constantine became emperor and he ended the empire-wide persecution of the Christians, and many of them were very grateful for that, but one of the downsides is that was the beginning of the church-state alliance, where the church has essentially been co-opted by the state. And ever since then, from that time until now, uh, it's manifested itself in many, many ways, uh, where essentially Christianity has become politicized and has sought to then claim political power. But if you go back to the first um, couple centuries of Christian history, that wasn't the case at all. So I'm just going to read a few quotes here. This is just a sampling uh, of what some of the early Christian theologians and, and church leaders thought about the state. So Justin Martyr, one of the early apologists, a very famous Samaritan theologian uh, living in the second century, said, and when you hear that we look for a kingdom, you suppose, without making any inquiry, that we speak of a human kingdom. For if we looked for a human kingdom, we should also deny our Christ. Origen, another very uh, influential theologian in the early church in the uh, second and third centuries, said, For we, do, we no longer take up sword against nation, nor do we learn war anymore, having become children of peace for the sake of Jesus, who is our leader. Tatian was an early Syrian theologian in the second century, said, I do not wish to be a king. I am not anxious to be rich. I decline military command. Tertullian, known essentially as the father of Western theology, one of the most influential uh, theologians of all time, uh, living in the second and third centuries, said this, shall a Christian carry a flag to hostile to Christ? And shall he ask a watchword from the emperor when he has already received one from God? Clement of Alexandria, a very early theologian in the second century said, above all, Christians are not allowed to correct by violence sinful wrongdoings. Sounds very libertarian to me. For it is not these who abstain from evil by compulsion, but those who abstain by choice that God crowns. For it is not possible for a man to be good steadily except by his own choice. Now, these were just a couple of things, a couple of quotes that we were, uh, that we pulled out, but there are tons and tons of examples of this from early Christian history. This is the earliest and most authentic Christian understanding of church-state relations, is that the church is not the state. The state is ultimately doomed to be subjected to God's rightful reign. And therefore, to say that you know, when, when Christians go out and they try to seize political power, they try to use the state to achieve Christian ends, not only does it not work, it actually runs contrary to what the apostles commanded them to do. So I'm going to turn it back over here to Doug. Was that thorough enough for you? No. Just, a, just a teaser for a lot of things, but that was good. We could probably have a whole conference on just those passages in Scripture and stuff. So, uh, so I want to wrap up with a couple other common objections that people, uh, that Christians will often you know, come up with. Well, aren't libertarians libertines? Or they, they don't may, may not say it in that way, but what they'll do is they will just say, well, doesn't that mean that if you're a libertarian, then anything can go, and there's no legal restrictions on things? And you have to remind them that it's not a comprehensive worldview. It is about, it's a political philosophy our, our take would be it's a political philosophy that says what are the limits of when, when is violence justified? And we would say that violence by the state is not justified. Therefore, all these other things, that you, and you're all here, you all know those things. You'll hear this one, are libertarians enablers of greed? And you'll hear this one often by people, Christians who are more on the left side of the political spectrum. They will say that, well, libertarians, yeah, they, they, they care all about liberty, but what they don't realize is they're enabling people to get filthy rich who don't care about the poor and will tilt the scales in their favor because they can buy out the government. Well, my instant reply is, well, that sounds like a government problem, giving them that power and allowing them to have that power to be able to be bought rather than just the, the, the fact of being wealthy. 
it, it's a longer conversation to have with somebody on that side because here's the thing, they're worried about monopolies like Walmart or, or Amazon or something like that, but the state is literally a monopoly in violence. And if you're talking with somebody on the left, they're typically going to be a nonviolence advocate. They're going to be more on the pacifist side of things. They're not going to be in favor of war. And so when you keep bringing up violence, it, it reiterates for them, they're endorsing a state that all it has is violence to endorse or to enforce anything it wants to do. So it puts them in a conundrum, I think. And then, of course, there are the social issues. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can be a pro-life or a pro-choice libertarian. We're pro-life. If you're a Christian and you're pro-life, you can be a pro-life libertarian instead of just a pro-life conservative. It's okay to do that. Uh, with the marriage issue, our position as libertarians typically is let's get the state out of marriage. The, you can still endorse that it is... We think you can still, as a Christian, endorse that it's a sacred institution for the church, but why is it any concern of the government whether it honors it as the same kind of sacred institution? So as we jump into uh, Q&A, we do have a mic if you want to turn it on. I do want to let you know how you can help join our movement, how to get uh, plugged in with LCI. Our website is libertarianchristians.com. And uh, you can like our Facebook page. We have a really great Facebook group. Are, is anybody here part of that Facebook group? You too. Don't. <laughs> Thank you. We have two in the room. They're my helpers. Um, we have a really great Facebook group. It's, um, there's many of them that are called like Libertarian Christian. It's actually Christian Libertarians. And if you are instantly presented with three questions to join, that's the one. Go to that website. That'll get you, that'll kind of, that'll link you to it. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. And we're always looking for contributors to our for, to our blog, our website, and uh, we'd like to do that. We'd like to have you uh, reach out to us. I know a lot of you are probably into writing about your faith, if you're, uh, and and how it connects with libertarianism. So now we are at the question and answer portion of our breakout session. As you can probably imagine, it's not the perfect conditions for a production level podcast. However, we did record it, and we wanted to share it with you. For those of you who were there, if your question did not get included in this episode. It was most likely because of audio reasons, and it's none of your fault. It's just that uh, we were working with what we have, and we did try to uh, include as many as possible. Hi. Um, I was wondering, as a libertarian Christian, your faith in the libertarian movement and the thing will eventually get better in the world, how that affects your eschatological views? Yeah, this I personally am what would be called a post-millennialist. Yeah. So, <laughs> So I, so I, so I'm I'm one of the optimists. I, I do believe that that fundamentally uh, the, the the state will break down uh, economically or otherwise, uh, even even prior to the final consummation of history and the return of Christ. But I, I am in a minority camp on that. But I was glad that there's some other post millennialists in the uh, in the room here. Hey, I'm just wondering what you guys think is on how we should influence within our churches that civil liberty movement. Because you know, our churches are, you know, my church as a whole is big on, you know, religious liberty and religious freedom. Spread that into other types of liberty without trying to use the pulpit as just, you know, nothing more than a political stamp. I would, my first impulse is to say, don't, I don't think anybody tries to do this, but don't be the obvious oddball in your church because no one's going to listen to you. Um, be cordial to people. Don't challenge, don't be the person who just like challenges every little thing. Make, make it with conversations and influence. Um, obviously state what you believe, but start off with, you know, hey, I, you know, I see things differently. I've really studied this particular issue and, you know, this is how I've come to, um, you know, to have a different view. Um, no one is, no one gains in a church by being divisive. Now, obviously we have very different views from a lot of people from like both the left and the right. So you want to state your views and be good at, at articulating them, but listen to questions. The objections aren't, m most objections aren't petty. So that, that would be a starting answer, at least. Uh, so I'm a Catholic libertarian, um, and, I, and I think you may have, you mentioned your podcast, and I think you did a podcast addressing Pope Francis' comments a couple months ago. Yes. And I was just wondering if uh, either one, you could kind of just give a brief kind of explanation to everyone here, but my, my understanding is there are papalists out there who kind of believe whatever the Pope says, no matter what it is. I'm not one of those people, but... He kind of did come out and bash libertarianism pretty hard. So I was wondering if you had any further comments on that or 
Anything, yeah. yeah, well, as you just already pitched that people should listen to our episode for that. So the reason that that episode existed was the Pope specifically called out libertarianism and made some accusations that just made my blood boil. And so we found Jeffrey Tucker, of course, to come on, and he was an awesome guest. He was an amazing guest. So uh, go listen to the episode. Nick can kind of maybe summarize the main thing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that we asked Jeffrey about in that episode, because, I mean... Doug and I are both Protestant, but so we, we were very grateful to have Jeffrey come on and address it from a Catholic perspective. But, you know, one of the things that, that he mentioned is that in, in Catholic theology, uh, the, it's not that everything the Pope ever says is authoritative. It's when he's speaking uh, ex cathedra. And so when the Pope comes out and, and makes political commentary or economic commentary, that's not a theological issue directly, and therefore he's outside of his area of authority in historic Catholic thought. Uh, but there, Jeffrey goes into a lot more uh, in that episode, so we, we definitely recommend that. So one thing that's not talked to a lot of Christians is that because uh, the government is involved in lawmaking, a lot of them view uh, government in some degree as being a teacher of morality in some sense. So, so, in the case of drugs, for instance, which most of which are illegal, what would you say to some Christian child the objection of making drugs legal? That if you make them, if you make them legal from a position of illegality, when it isn't is the government endorsing that? Like, how would you combat that objection? So, the first thing that I think a lot of Christians or anyone else who, who wants to use law or the state to shape morality, they don't realize that this actually comes from Aristotle. So if you, you read the works of Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics, the politics, uh, in, in the pre-Christian era, I mean, this is essentially his, his argument. It's a pre-Christian argument. Uh, and Christians have adopted this sort of subconsciously throughout the ages without even realizing it. But fundamentally, it, it, it simply comes down to the ethics of what does God command us to do as far as how we relate to, to others. And as, as we covered here, I mean, he, he, he does not want us to use violence and force against people who need help. Uh, so, I mean, you know, no one, I think, in our organization is going to say that going out and doing heroin or cocaine is, is good, okay? It's not good, and it's a, it, it's a sinful action, it's destructive to the individual, but to take that person and lock them in a cage rather than minister to them, give them medical help, give them the gospel, uh, is, is a very wicked act. And uh, that, that fundamentally it comes down to that, it's just the ethics of how we go about things. I would add that those kinds of laws are also subject to economic uh, evaluation and for many people who probably read Bastiat's The Law, I would suggest that to people who have those those questions of like, what is, what can the government do? What are people allowed to do to, co to collectively? And when you, when you evaluate things like on economics, I mean, think back to most Christians aren't going to advocate for prohibition legally, but we look back and we see the dangerous effects of, of prohibition. So legally might actually mean less of it. Hi, um, so I have another question uh, specifically about uh, Catholic Libertarians. Um, now, I'm also a Catholic Libertarian, and um, some of my friends have jokingly referred to me as an oxymoron. And um, <laughs> because uh, compared to other Christian sects that um, c Catholics are usually the, uh, consider the sect of Christianity that has the most structure, they have the Pope, and they, they're more uh, focused on hierarchy and duty, and a lot of them would tend to be more favorable, this is just a generalization, more favorable of the government compared to other Christians. And um, I just uh, want to ask if you have any things I could say to, to, Christ, to Catholics who, um, to make them more favorable living in government, because I see a lot of Catholics that, I'm involved in a lot of Catholic groups, a lot of them are conservatives, but they're skeptical about being libertarians because they think libertarians are like, as you said before, libertines, that they're not into structure and they're like anything goes. So if you have any advice about how to convert, based on those grounds, more Catholics to libertarians. So one of the first things I would say, uh, we already mentioned Jeffrey Tucker earlier, who has a lot of other stuff that he's done throughout his career that's kind of in the wheelhouse there. So I would say look to those resources. Uh, Tom Woods has done many things uh, it, relating to 
uh, libertarianism and Catholic thought, so he, I would say go to those books and his podcast as well. Um, and another historical point that I would make is that throughout the Middle Ages, uh, the, the, the Catholic Church was really a counter-authority to state authority. And so really, when you actually study the history of the Middle Ages, I mean, we see this coming up time and time again. The church and the state are clashing. Uh, so it's not that the Catholic thought is intrinsically friendly to statism. It's not. Uh, in fact, for, for the overwhelming majority of its history, it, it has, has been the opposite. Uh, so I, I, would, I would probably start in those places. Did you? Okay. Uh, I'll preface this which, uh, with, you know, I completely agree with your, your reading of the Bible and, and how that affects all this. Um, but looking at some of the quotes from the early church fathers, um, one thing that kind of stood out to me and, and it kind of made me think was about, you know, how the Romans' destruction of the temple affected the Jewish faith and how perhaps the persecution of early Christians could have affected the way that they looked at some of these things. You know, they just want to back up and say, hey, look, um, I'm not here to be a ruler. I'm not here to do anything militaristically. I just want to practice my faith. Please don't come get us, that sort of thing. Um, how, how would you kind of look at that? Well, one of the things to remember is that the, the, the persecution of the early Christians for, for quite some time was actually just very sporadic. It, it was in different pockets throughout the empire. So there wasn't any empire-wide persecution of Christians until the time of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so uh, a lot of this thinking comes from a time prior to uh, the, the, the heavy persecution of Christians that, that came down later, uh, which was then ended, uh, ended by, by Constantine and the Edict of Milan. So that, that would be my first point. My second point would be that it, even, even if uh, it is the case that in, in some cases their thinking may have been shaped by that, uh, this is still the earliest or, or the closest generations chronologically to the time of the apostles. Uh, and it's, it's some of these, some of the guys who, uh, I, I don't think we quoted we quote anyone who was directly uh, affiliated to the apostles, but there, were, there are quotes like this uh, from people in the second generation of Christians, uh, and we have their writings, and these are people who knew John and Matthew and Paul and Peter. Uh, saying the same thing. So really, it's just a matter of chronologically, um, this, is, this is the earliest way of thinking about these things in Christianity, and it was that case for several hundred years, and it changed at, at the time of Constantine. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's a breadth of these. It's not just a few one-offs. And, and Correct. I mean, if you, if you really wanted to dive into the academic literature, I mean, there's just copious monographs detailing what we just summarized in five little quotes here. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So a lot of our friends are liberal. I'm just wondering, is there a really specific message that reaches them better than others? Is there like one or <laughs> four idea that they really care about more than others? Free no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'd say that. You, I don't know if everybody heard it. If, you're, if you have friends who are more on the left politically, um, they are, yeah, what's that? Massachusetts, baby. Yeah, right, oh man. <laughs> No, I mean, the nonviolence, the point of nonviolence being consistently applied through libertarianism, that there is no moral justification for, another, for an institution to commit violence against people who would, uh, is, is probably a big point to, to reiterate um, over and over again. I would, probably, I would probably lean on writers who may not identify as libertarian, but are in, that, that are, uh, respected among their circles. So you have people like Scott McKnight, Stanley Hauerwas, uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, Greg Boyd, Brian Zahn. Those are people who are going to have an approach to theology that is going to appeal to those who are on the left. N.T. Wright also. N.T. Wright. Those people are not going to really identify as libertarians per se, but their theology is, I mean, really, is a, we base a lot of our theology on the, kind of their writings and their way of thinking. So it, the nonviolence thing, um, the other thing on a practical level is libertarians have a very, we have what could be a good alliance with them. 
Think about the Federal Reserve. Think about the, the monopoly on the printing of money and how that harms the poor. Yeah. So find those types of inroads because they do care about the, the poor and those who don't have power. As we talked about, you know, are, are libertarians enabling greed? No, we want to get rid of the Fed so that it doesn't enable the greedy to have all, you know, to have money first and, and have the inflation taxes, Ron Paul calls it. So, um, yeah, you got to find those, those issues. But then also, I mean, I always bring it back to nonviolence and how they're the oxymoron saying that the state <laughs> is, uh, you know, is, is good, yet they're also nonviolent. And that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. So Yeah, totally. Uh, kind of bouncing off an earlier question, I was wondering what your uh, response would be to the claim that um, because God would judge na nations in the Old Testament that uh, many more status Christians today would claim that for that reason, the, the nation and the state must be utilized to enforce Christian ideas. You mean God would use nations to punish Israel for disobedience, or like God is like the chess player of the nations? Like um, More that God would judge, judge nations and governments based on their you know, moral systems. Yeah, I mean, it, it fundamentally just comes down to the distinction between what God does and what you know, God commands us to, to do. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of things that, as libertarians, we would say we don't want to make illegal, uh, but that, again, that doesn't mean that they're good. It doesn't mean that people should do them. It doesn't mean that the church cannot and should not uh, speak out against these things. This is one of the, the problems with, with the left, is there's this idea that there's this right to not be offended, and that's totally bogus. You know, sometimes you, people are going to say things to you that offend you, and Christians uh, have the right to speak out against uh, sin and society's ails, it, 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 and we should. The, the issue is just not using the, the, the force of law uh, to try and shape people into that mold, which, which doesn't work anyway. I do have something. If, if I was reflecting on your question while he was answering, it sounds like there, there's some verses in the Old Testament that seem like God wants to hold governments accountable for taking care of the poor. Is yeah, that what you refer to? Yeah. Well, a couple things. I would say that, one, the United States is not in a covenant with God, with Yahweh, the way Israel was. So there's that obligation comparison kind of goes out the window. That God cares about how government, or how states, I should say, that God cares about how states... I want to use the word care for the poor lightly in, in, in the broadest sense possible. They don't have to be active. Letting people, letting capitalism grow is a better way to care for the poor than a, a welfare program. Yep. Um, I will, and, and, and I'll just lay cards on the table a little bit here. If I'm arguing with somebody on the left who like, that's their big hanging point, I'm like, sure, you can have your welfare because now we're gonna have a 99% smaller government than we have today. Can we, can we start talking about all the other stuff that you're okay with? Because at that point, I mean, we're dealing with super small government if all that is is helping care for the poor. Um, so in terms of like talking about that, but that's what I would say is that we're dealing with different scenario um, in, in, different, in different areas. And there's no automatic assumption that the United States government is the institution that should carry out those, those dictates. My question uh, has to do with uh, leftists again. Um, I found talking with some leftists who are more, like not just amateurs, but pastors and uh, you know who identify as social justice warriors and things like that, um, that really all that they're about is sort of creating the kingdom of God here on earth via political action and, and sort of human humans building this this kingdom, and they never ever talk about about Christ. Is that that's sort of the, the um, experience you've had, and, and what, how would we, how, how best to, to address these, these sorts of. The quick answer, because we're over time, would be Kingdom Conspiracy by Scott McKnight. Would you agree? Um, that is an amazing book, and he doesn't, he's not a libertarian, although he, he almost default. <laughs> if, if he had to be dropped into a bucket, that's where it would be, I think. But uh, anyway, he doesn't identify that way. So it's called Kingdom Conspiracy by Scott McKnight. In terms of uh, many, many Christians tend to fall in the neoconservative uh, sphere of political ideology. I personally don't think, like was suggested in last in the foreign policy session previously, I don't think calling Christians murderers is a particularly good way to reach them in terms of a non-interventionist foreign policy. So how would you tackle the question of uh, foreign policy um, when talking to conservatives who lean towards the 
George W. Bush, uh, neoconservative point of view. I would appeal to their pro-life inclinations and tell them that they're not really pro-life. I mean, you don't want to be antagonistic, but if, if, and no, you can't call them quote unquote murderers. I mean, that doesn't work in terms of rhetoric and argument, but I would appeal to their pro-life sensibilities in, in, in that. I mean, I was, I was in that camp I'm trying to think here. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I became a libertarian out of a consistent ethic of being pro-life and pro-peace, and it just made sense to be a libertarian, because I was at one point a neocon, like a decade ago. So that was the breakout Q&A, and we also had some people come to our booth afterward and ask some questions on Mike, and so we're going to get into that now, and then we'll wrap up the episode. Hi, uh, my name is Brooke. I am Eastern Orthodox, and uh, I consider myself very, very traditional. Um, probably very, very traditional. And so, like, I've always been a libertarian, though, and I've, I haven't always been an Orthodox Christian. So, for someone that feels like an inner conflict of being very, very socially conservative and wanting to still abide by, you know, libertarianism, how would you, um, at least in terms of talking about morality? and law. I mean, there's certain things that should be illegal, of course, like murder and rape and all of that, but there's also sins that are also considered bad under Christian doctrine. So how, at what point are we like not allowed to legislate morality? Like, do we, and what standards do we actually use? I think the baseline uh, is just what we call the non-aggression principle, right? So if you look at even the writings of Augustine and other early theologians, you know, Augustine has this point that not all vices are crimes. And so the, the, the point is that things that may be sinful for somebody, I mean, your thoughts can be sinful, but nobody wants, well, some people do, but, but we wouldn't want to go out and start legislating thought crime. Uh, it's a very Orwellian concept. So it, it really comes down to the non-aggression principle and uh, maintaining the order and stability of society, uh, but that doesn't mean that we go out and... Um, and, and try to impose a comprehensive ethic using law. Uh, you know, like we talked about in the session, number one, it doesn't work. Number two, it's not what God told us to do. On that basis, I would say number three, it's offensive to God to try to do that. Like, how far can we stretch using the non-aggression principle? Because you could argue, for example, one, one sin may be har like automatically by allowing certain sins in society that could actually harm people by allowing it. I mean, obviously I'm not being like very clear, I'm not using a specific one, but like, oh, how far at least can we stretch the non-aggression principle and does it always apply in every situation? I mean, there's, there's differences even of application in what the non-aggression principle means, and libertarians have even internally been debating this for for a very long time, but the the baseline premise, I would say, yes, always, always applies, and I mean, it, it really comes down to how God has actuated the world, and there are things that, many things, that God allows uh, to happen, but which he doesn't ethically approve of. And so as far as we're concerned, with our limited knowledge as humans, we have to just work within the framework that God has given us, and do what he's told us to do, and not do the things he's told us not to do, and trust that even if we don't understand how it all fits together, uh, fundamentally and ultimately he will work it out. No offense, but I, like, and I'm saying this as a former Calvinist who used to believe that God hated the non-elect. I remember one time I was doing some pro-life activism and this Baptist lady says, remember God loves them. I thought, no, he doesn't. He hates them. I used to think that way. But despite this, I'm still surprised that there are so many Calvinists who are libertarian leaning. Why do you think this is? Historically, I think it... It comes down to the fact that because Calvinism has such a high emphasis on the sovereignty of God, uh -huh. uh, there's, I mean, well, as was even brought up during our session, you know, uh, the, the theonomists. Actually, the, the weird thing is, when you look at a lot of the modern theonomists, many of them identify as libertarian, which is kind of strange. Uh, but I, I think the, the, the way that they get there is because Calvinism has this high emphasis on the sovereignty of God, Sort of the corollary implication of that is that there's a low emphasis on man and man's institutions, which would include the state or human kingship or what have you. So, I mean, there, there, there's certainly many uh, 
and many theonomists and many many Calvinists uh, who are 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 not libertarian. But I think that for those who are, that's probably how they get there. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's kind of a mixed bag. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Hi, my name is Lily, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I have a friend who, um, like I was, was educated when we were young um, about the nature of man. Uh, basically, that man is intrinsically sinful, and also such ideas as the depravity of man and that kind of thing, um, total depravity. Um, however, it seems that um, libertarians... Um, take up the position that if man is actually given um, freedom that instead of doing the wrong thing macroscopically on a societal scale he will do the right thing uh, as opposed to government intervention which would um, interfere with him actually being able to do the right sensible thing and so um, for my friend even though I don't come from that perspective um, what would you say to answer that concern like because that is a hindrance for some people to approach um, a libertarian political position um, just this idea that if they do actually give people freedom instead of using it to do good things it will mean the destruction of society as opposed to the good of the society so what would you say in response to that so it, it is true that sometimes people will use their freedom to do bad things. Um, and I think that, you know, when we look at, at biblical theology, uh, we, we aren't told to expect a sinless utopia this side of, of eternity. So there will always be uh, some element of, of sin and, and aggression in, in, until the, the eternal state. Um, but fundamentally, you know, the, 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 the quote that's often used uh, in, in defense of some type of statism comes from the Federalist, it's the James Madison quote, you know, if men were angels, we'd have no need of government. Well, I would counter and say, you know, if, if men are intrinsically sinful, if there is total depravity of the human nature, uh, then why would we take a select group of sinners and give them a monopoly on uh, force against all the rest of us? Because they're just as sinful as anyone else. Uh, and so we're not going to find an ideal system uh, this side of eternity. But in, in, in the absence of that, uh, I, I think that the best thing we can do is let the market and, and voluntary contracts go forward and uh, not try to monopolize, give, give some sinners monopoly power with the state over all the rest of us, that's just an aberration and, it, they, and they're going to be tempted to abuse that power. So some of the best checks and balances uh, on, on sinful action, I think, come out of, out of the market. And, and then fundamentally, the church has to take a leading role in uh, arbitrating and propounding correct ethics to society in, in the absence of a state. Thank you. I guess a natural follow-up question to that then would be, um, in Christian theology, when somebody becomes regenerate, instead of having Adam's nature, which is in fact the sinful nature, intrinsic sin of man, they inherit Jesus' nature, which is um, a nature of, uh, I guess, a new heart, um, uh, the desire to do the right thing as opposed to do the wrong thing. However, it seems, at least from my perspective, that a liberty-based a liberty -based system actually works for a lot of people who, um, I guess, haven't had that um, regeneration experience, have not had their hearts switched out. So... Why does liberty work, <laughs> even in those circumstances? Um, and so, why would does liberty work in those circumstances? Um, would liberty work in a Muslim nation, where liberty was was the way that people people governed? And if so, do you have a theological um, reason? for believing that it would work, besides the fact that it just seems to? So as far as a Muslim nation, uh, I, I'm not sure that it would, uh, but I'm certainly not an expert on Muslim theology. I mean, I, there, are, there, there are Muslim libertarian groups out there, 
Uh, I, I don't know a lot about them personally, but I mean, if if if, if I, I mean, obviously, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna defend Islamic theology because I'm not a Muslim. But I mean, if they can make it work, uh, I, I would say from a practical perspective, I guess I'm I'm glad that there's less uh, theocracy going on if if they can make that work. But no, fundamentally. Um, the, the gospel has to be involved in order to affect long-term societal change. So the, the market can only take us so far, and I, I do think that the market is a natural check on uh, the, the growth of aggressive powers and forces. Uh, if only for the profit motive. I, I think that just naturally is the way the market tends to work uh, and, and works far superior to, to the state. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, the reason we're, we're libertarian Christians is because, or, or libertarian, I should emphasize the, the Christian part, the reason why we're libertarian Christians is because, you know, we believe that ultimately man is in need of that regeneration and... Therefore, only when the gospel is, is sort of brought to bear on society are we really going to get the most mileage, if you will, out of, out of the market and out of liberty, if that makes sense. Okay, so when I say a Muslim nation, um, I don't necessarily mean one where there's a state religion of Islam. What I mean is one where the majority of people who are part of that nation espouse one or more, I guess, of the different um, ways of following Islam. And so it, it's not a state religion. Um, it's more uh, just the religion that everybody has, the government itself being more of a liberty government where people have the freedom of one religion versus another supposing that they wanted to. It's just instead of the majority being Christian, the majority are Muslim. So um, in that circumstance, um, is libertarianism enough of a robust system that it would work even in those circumstances? And if so, is there a theological reasoning where you can justify why it would work? So... When we look at the Middle East, you know, there, there, there's a number of governments in Islamic countries that, that either currently exist or previously existed, uh, where the government is essentially secular, even though it's a predominantly Muslim country. Uh, and so I, and I, I do think that the laws of economics are universal, so yeah, in, in, in theory, I would say, uh, it, it could work to an extent, uh, in as much as the market works anywhere, um, in, in a predominantly Muslim country that is that has a secular government rather than a Sharia or theocratic government. Um, so, yeah, in, 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 in theory, it, it, would, it would work in the same way that the market can work uh, anywhere, even in, in countries that are now becoming predominantly atheist, like you see in Scandinavian countries, although they don't really have the market. Those are also often very socialist countries, but but, but the market works anywhere. Um, but, again, it, it only takes us so far, and so ultimately, in order to really make the lasting change that a society needs, uh, it, it has to involve Christ at the center. So that wraps up our episode for the Young Americans for Liberty Conference breakout session held in 2017. Thank you for joining us on this episode. For those of you who we got to meet in person, it was a pleasure meeting you, and we hope to maybe meet you on the internet or maybe at a future convention sometime. If you would like to reach out to us, you can reach us at podcasts at libertarianchristians.com, as well as on Twitter, Facebook, and our website, where you can also support us at libertarianchristians.com slash donate. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. The audio engineers were Doug Stewart and Jason Rink, and voiceovers were by Matthew Bellis and Caitlin Horn. If you'd like to find out more about the LCI, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianchristians.com. Libertarian Christian Podcast.